Lord, I'm asking, fill this thing. Fill this thing, Lord. Renew some old values to us today. Build them into us, Lord, until they're just so much part of our character we can't let it go. Amen. It's important for a group like ours from time to time to reinforce the values. It's like, you know, if you don't tune up your car from time to time, if you don't change the oil, then pretty soon the car doesn't run so good. You know how that works? And so once in a while, we kind of need an oil change. Got to get a tune-up. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And in the ancient Near East, salt was a big deal. It was preservative and it was a flavoring. And they would keep it in pots. And sometimes if a wife was like cleaning the floor, the water would soak into the bottom of that pot and it would precipitate out the salt. And so you'd get this useless salt that could only be thrown out. It's like, um, anybody here have a fish tank? Right, you put a little salt in it, don't you? No, you don't. Okay, well... There goes my illustration. <laughs> well, actually, you put a little salt in the fish tank, it'll precipitate out on the edges, and it's this kind of yucky brown salt stuff that you want to get rid of. Well, that's what would happen. So he says, if, if, how can it be made, if it's become tasteless, how can it be made salty? Again, it's, it's not good for anything. We as Christians are what makes the world a good place. We're the seasoning that makes this world tasty. We're the preservative in, in, in the world. We, we, we sustain things, whether you believe it or not. We, subst- we sustain things. Our presence here sustains things. Jesus was warning Israel against ceasing to be what they were called to be because if they did, then they'd be useless, useless for God's purposes. And so what he's, what he's giving them is a promise and a warning all rolled into one, and it applies to all of God's people. It applies to us here. Then he says, verse 14, you are, the li- you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So he says, you are the light of the world. Now, most of us would say Jesus is the light of the world. Well, that's true, but that's not what he says here. He says, you are the light of the world. In him is no darkness at all. In us, there ought to be no darkness at all. We are the light that reveals who and what Jesus is in this world and who the Father God really is. And as they see us, they should see him. The revelation of the Father's love This is all simple stuff, guys. The revelation of the Father's love should define our identity, define our image in the world. Now, some years ago, the Lord reminded me about this. Some years ago, I had a dream, a prophetic dream. New song in this dream was on top of a hill and uh, overlooking the city. The city was all around. And the building was a whole lot larger than this one is now. And there was no roof. All over the city below us, there were storm clouds. We could actually kind of look down on these storm clouds. And thunder and lightning were, was, was going on everywhere, but over us it was calm. And then this light snow began to fall, but it wasn't cold. And it was all really, really beautiful. The symbolism of the building size is that we will be, we are supposed to be larger than we are. The absence of a roof is a symbol that there's a, there, there would be and is an open heaven over us. An open heaven over us. The snow meant we would go through a period of cleansing from defilement and sin and be made clean. And we have been through a season like that since I had this dream. If you want to know where the symbolism of the snow comes from, that's Isaiah 1.18. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they'll be like wool. Being on top of a hill means that we will be allowed to stand above the storm. And for years I've said there's a storm coming. Have you seen it gathering? I mean, come on, watch the news. Watch the riots. Watch the protests, the hatred that's been rising. 
We'll be allowed to stand above the storm. We'll be protected. And the people will be able to see at a distance because it's on a hill, to see at a distance where to come for the Lord's love, for the Lord's presence, and for the Lord's touch, his healing, his power, in the midst of the storm and in the midst of the gathering darkness. A city set on a hill, a light to the world around us made visible, not concealed. Now there are four elements that make for a church, a body of people walking in covenant together, that make for them to become A light set on a hill. I've often used the term lighthouse. That there are lighthouse churches and ministries in these last days being raised up to shine like that, like in the dream. There are four things, I think, that are are foundational values for us that make up lighthouse churches. They define us as a people. They make us salty. If we lose those, we become tasteless. If we walk in them, we light up the world. So here's the first one, and if you want to write it down, it's written up there in the graphic. Presence-based. It's not about the show. It's not about a slick presentation. It's not even really about the songs we sing. It's not about the hot band. It's not about any particular formula or program. It's about being focused on seeking and experiencing the presence of God. It's about entering into the flow of His Spirit, His power, and His love. We want His presence, not a program. Not something that's perfectly scheduled. We want his presence. We want his presence. And that sets worship in spirit and in truth is our highest priority because it's worship more than any other thing that opens the heavens. If we ever lose our sense of worship, we might as well close. Worship opens the heavens. There was, a, there was the cloud of glory that descended over the dedication of Solomon's temple. I, 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 always, I go back to that story because I'm saying, Lord, I want that cloud in this place. We once had a leaky roof, but that didn't do the trick. So. <laughs> I want that cloud in this place. Like the cloud that descended over Solomon's temple when it was dedicated and the priests couldn't even stand up to minister. I'm trying to picture these priests crawling around on their hands and knees trying to do their duty. That happened in worship as they offered more animals in sacrifice than could be counted. Listen, extravagant sacrifices to the Lord. If we want that glory, extravagant sacrifices to the Lord, not laid back with our hands folded watching something go on and waiting to be entertained. It's an engagement. It's an engagement with everything that we are. Let our sacrifice of praise be whole, passionate, extravagant. That's foundational for us. Then you get Paul and Silas. They were in prison. This is just an illustration of the same thing. They're in prison. In the book of Acts, they've been beaten with rods. And, they're, and you want to know what that's like? You know, if you take a rod about that big around, and you take about eight or nine of them, and you bind them in a bundle, and you start beating somebody's back as hard as you can, those rods pinch together. And the skin gets horribly bruised and sometimes torn. So they've been beaten with rods. They're locked in the stocks in the inner prison with their feet locked in the stocks. They've got to be in pain. And about midnight, what are they doing? They're worshiping God, singing praises, being rude to the other prisoners who can't sleep because they're raising some song. And God sent an earthquake, and their chains fell off, and they were freed because the heavens open, and God's power comes. And that resulted in the jailer taking them home, washing their wounds, and, and they preached the gospel, and the jailer's whole, house, whole household came to, came to Jesus and got filled with the Spirit. So we worship God for God's sake to bless him with all the passion that's in us. And we press into his presence, no matter how we feel or what, I move, what our mood might be. You know, that's what makes it a sacrifice. You come in here, you don't feel like worshiping. Oh God, I'm having a mood today. Well, that's when the sacrifice begins, right? That's when it costs you something. So no matter how we feel or what our mood might be, until we break into the sense of his presence and we know the touch of his love. And it takes as long as it takes. That's why it's not a program. That's why we don't do 15 or 20 minutes to entertain the people and then move on. We worship until we feel a breakthrough, feel a release. 
And that's why sometimes we'll go to 20, we'll go an hour and 20 minutes. And another Sunday, it's one hour. Because we'll, we'll, we'll do it until we get that breakthrough into a sense of the presence of the Lord and we know the touch of his love. It takes as long as it takes because it's not a program or a time limit. It's all of us engaging. Here's the second thing. Freedom for God to move. Freedom for God to move. In a salty lighthouse ministry, God is free to move in any way he chooses. And you know what? He doesn't care who it makes uncomfortable. I mean, really. Some people, one of, one of, my, pet, one of my pet things to say is it was really popular for a long time to say God is a gentleman. He won't do anything without permission. Well, you might want to tell that to the Apostle Paul while he's sucking dust boogers on his face on the road to Damascus and, and, and he's blinded. And the voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Which is the stupidest question in the entire Bible. Since when is God a gentleman? He's a king. Kings don't have to be gentlemen, do they? They just do what they want. And so if God chooses, if God chooses to be quiet, we'll be quiet. If he chooses stillness, we'll be still. If he chooses dancing and clapping, then we're going to clap and dance. And if he chooses to make a mess, then that's where we'll be. That's going to make some people uncomfortable. But you know what? I'd rather have the unleashed power of the living God than the deadness of what makes people comfortable any day of the week. Now, when he moves, leadership, people like me, we've got to get out of the way. And we, make, we have to make room for out-of-the-box things to happen that we haven't planned. It's not a packaged program. And when you look back at history... Unusual, messy, out-of-the-box manifestations and occurrences have been part of every visitation of the Spirit that has ever impacted this culture. We need to allow God to be God. Some of my favorite stories come out of the Second Great Awakening in the early 1800s when they did the Cane Ridge camp meetings and thousands of people would go out and camp for days and weeks at a time and the Holy Spirit would fall and hundreds of people would be out in the Spirit on the ground and they'd have to send in worship, they'd have to send in ministry team members to carry them out and lead them through repentance. And the testimonies are that some of the women would begin to shake so violently that their long hair would come out of the buns they kept it in and they would be whipping it from side to side and it would crack like a whip. And nobody got hurt. <laughs> Hello, these things happen sometimes when the Holy Spirit comes. The next one is a culture of honor. Culture of honor by definition sees the worth and the value and the significance of every person without exception, no matter who they might be or where they come from or whatever is their condition. So from top leadership all the way down to the most average person who sits the pew, respect, encouragement, and uplift are the order of the day. That can only work, and once you hear me with this, that can only work within the context of community. It can only happen when there's a commitment to one another in honor, in relationship. And so one of the things we work at, and sometimes we don't do so well, but one of the things we work at is putting structures in place where relationships can happen. We can't force people to participate. We can't make them go to a meeting. But we can put the opportunities out there, and we do whether it's a men's meeting or a women's meeting or a home group that meets on Wednesday night or celebrate recovery downstairs or the prophetic school that begins Tuesday night. Places where people can plug in and connect. Because relational love stands at the heart of the kingdom of God. It's a love that affirms. It's a love that respects. It's a love that, re that, that lifts. And as I preach this, I feel like, boy, I'm, you know, I'm, not preaching great revelation, but we need to get it. You realize the majority of the content, listen, do you realize the majority of the content of the letters of Paul in the Bible, which is most of the New Testament, the majority of that content isn't about doctrine. It's about relationships. I mean, go read it. It's about relationships, either with God or with one another. And often it's both of those intertwined. And when he wrote about doctrine, 
it was almost never a standalone thing. It was almost always, when he taught about doctrine, it was almost always connected with how good or bad theology affected relationships with God and affected relationships with one another. We serve a relational God. God didn't call you to isolate. And if you think he did, that was a lie from the pit. Some demon told you that and called itself God. So we're going to come back to the culture of honor in a minute because that's really the bulk of this today. So hold that thought. The next thing is a healing atmosphere. A healing atmosphere. We want to, we want to cultivate a healing atmosphere. I literally, this is my goal, I literally want to see cancer left at the door. You walk through that door, your cancer is gone before anything else happens. That's what I want to see. Because that, that horrible, abominable, hateful illness cannot exist in the presence of God's healing spirit. That's what I want to see. That's where I want us to camp our faith and our desire. I think the, I think the foyer should be a parking lot for useless wheelchairs. <laughs> we, should be no, we should be donating useless hearing aids to charity organizations because the moment the wearers pass through our doors, their hearing is restored. I believe that's the kind of presence God wants us to have. And I don't believe we should settle for anything less. I think most of the laying on of hands for healing should probably be done in restaurants and stores. I mean, that's where Jesus did them. And we know that a healing atmosphere can never happen without a culture of honor to undergird it. Because where there's no honor, people get hurt. And so in this church, we do and we will work at various healing ministries, as many as we can think of. Healing ministries for the heart, healing ministries for the body. We're going to provide everything we possibly can to make life wonderful and whole for everybody who comes to Jesus. We want to demonstrate the love of God and his, and his restorative power to a world. And we want to shine that out to the world around us. A city set on a hill, seen, visible, not hidden, drawing the lost, drawing those who hunger for God in a time of gathering storm. Now, back to the culture of honor, and that's the bulk of it today. Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Jesus went out from there. He came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. It was, that was the custom. We'd gather in the synagogue, and the men would take turns sharing from Scripture. Even if there was a rabbi, the rabbi would teach, but others would be able to share. When Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what is this wisdom given to him in such miracles as these performed in his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. This is the kid we saw with dirty diapers. This is the kid we saw drooling when he was a baby. This is the kid we saw going to yeshiva to learn the scriptures with everybody else. This is the kid. And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, without honor, except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. It wasn't unbelief that hindered Jesus. It wasn't their lack of faith that bottled up Jesus' power and tied his hands. It was the atmosphere of a failure to honor. Verse 3, they took offense at him. Verse 4, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. If the lack of an atmosphere of honor bottled up the power that Jesus carried, and if that limited the miracles he could do, how much more would that affect us? Power flows in an atmosphere of honor granted to people that we might not otherwise think to honor or who seem unworthy of honor. And where people will not honor one another, God restrains his hand. 
It's the atmosphere of honor versus an atmosphere of dishonor. They call Jesus the son of Mary. A man was always known by his father's heritage. That was his identity. Heritage was handed down through the male line. And so a man was always known as, as the son of his father, sons of Zebedee, sons of Siva, sons of Abraham, sons of Jacob. Lineage and heritage, tracked through the father's line. You knew who you were by tracking what man you came from. And so to call a man the son of his mother was an ugly insult. It was to say that his mother was immoral and that he had no value. You don't have any value with us because you don't even know who your father is. No heritage. So when they called Jesus the son of Mary, it was a sword thrust into his heart that was designed to bring him down and rob him of any kind of dignity. And so when Jesus, this one they thought they knew, presumed to teach them in their synagogues and wield the power of God and gather disciples, they took offense. Nothing erodes the spirit of honor faster than the spirit of offense. Nathan said it before, I'll say it again. If you've taken offense at someone, you're wrong. End of story. If you've taken offense, you're wrong, period. Period. There's no reason, no excuse, nothing, you're wrong. Honor creates an atmosphere that frees the flow of power. Power will not flow freely in an atmosphere of dishonor. Dishonor of one another is a form of unbelief in God. You want to know why? Because when I'm honoring somebody, I'm trusting what Holy Spirit is doing in them. And I'm trusting that Holy Spirit will do it in them. There are a lot of people who by themselves I don't trust, but I trust that God is doing something in them. And that makes a difference. An atmosphere of honor will be an atmosphere of faith. Because in that atmosphere, we're choosing to believe in what God is doing in the hearts and lives of the unbelievable. Trusting in the work of the Holy Spirit. That's why 1 Corinthians 13 says, love believes all things and hopes all things. You'll never redeem somebody and lead them to Jesus if you don't believe in the image of God imprinted into them in the ability of the Holy Spirit to move. See, that kind of love opens the heavens. So again, the definition of honor, to ascribe value, place, and position to a person. People of Nazareth were, th Nazareth were, were threatened by who Jesus had become, and they wanted to strip him of, of, of place and value and position so they could feel better about themselves. We know his mother, his brothers, his sisters. We don't know who his father is. He's nothing. Who does he think he is? And that blocked the power of God. Honor releases it. An atmosphere and a culture of honor. See, the function of a culture is to condition the people who are part of it until you think instinctively and act instinctively the way the culture conditions you to think and act. Do you know why gay marriage has become so acceptable in America? We've had 20 years of cultural conditioning. Beth and I love to watch sci-fi. We love all the superheroes. And every one of those shows now has a gay couple presented as normal. We are being culturally conditioned to think a certain way. And so it gradually seeps in until that's the way we think. That's the negative side. What if we had a culture of light and honor? What if everybody that came into our midst was conditioned by the surroundings to think and feel in edifying ways? Wouldn't that be awesome? That's where we're going. That's what we need to create here. It's really a culture of the Father's love because the Father honors. I've been in places where there was an atmosphere of faith, where there was a tremendous emphasis on faith, and everybody expected things to happen. They were confessing that things would happen, and nothing happened. In fact, some of those places were, were the most legalistic, unloving churches I've ever seen. But I've never been in a place where there was an atmosphere of honor, a culture of honor where I didn't see glorious things happening, ever. An atmosphere of, I mean, I've been in ministry almost 41 years now, full time. An atmosphere of dishonor has infused almost every church I've known 
until what God has been doing in our midst right now, until now. That same thing infects the culture around us. We're changing. And we have been for a period of time now. We're changing. What the critical spirit does is it belittles and deprives people of value. It locks them into our unholy, unloving opinions of them, and it minimizes who and what they are until we're blinded to their changes. We don't see them changing, so we don't honor them. Lack of honor actually prevents the changes. That's why I was, Gail was preaching my sermon today. Thank you. <laughs> she did good. It prevents the changes. When Lazarus died, Jesus stood before his tomb, said, roll away the stone. It's one place I love the way the King James translates. He said, roll away the stone. They said, Lord, by this time he stinketh. <laughs> roll away the stone. And he stood in front of it and he said, Lazarus, come forth. But that isn't where it ended. Lazarus comes out wrapped in his grave clothes, looking you know, like this. And Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. Take the grave clothes off. In honor, we need to unbind one another and let one another go. Call it resurrection, part two. You know, we call people out of death, we call them out of darkness, and then we unbind them. We take the grave, the, the, the grave wrappings off and, and we, let them go, we let them go from our opinions and judgments so they, we set them free from that. So that they can live, so they can grow. God desperately, hugely loves and favors you. Let that sink in. Because that's an easy one to lose. Desperately loves and favors you. And I know that one root of the dishonor that one person can heap on another is that they don't really know how honoring God is toward themselves. People who don't know how God greatly honors them will have trouble honoring others. And if you feed on the negative in yourself, you're going to feed on it in others. But if you know how much the Father loves you, you know how much he, he favors you, you can't help but love and favor the most unlovable and unfavorable around you. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. It is really comforting to me to know that the writer of Hebrews had the same problem with people attending church that I do. <laughs> See, on the one hand, the apostle was definitely saying, stop skipping church. I mean, it, isn't that clear enough? Because you can't encourage anybody if you're not there to do it. But the real point is that this passage holds out a vision of an atmosphere or a culture of honor among God's people that encourages and uplifts and stimulates all of its members. I was raised by, um, by parents whose culture taught them that if you gave a child a compliment, he'd get a big head, and he'd be filled with pride. So if you wanted the child to do better, you would criticize the child because that would motivate the child to try to do better. Actually, it's exactly the other way around. What it really did was destroy us, and it made, us, made it really, really hard to believe the Sunday school lesson when it said, Jesus loves me, this I know. Really hard to believe. Well, that approach meant that my parents and I were headed for a serious train wreck from day one because I was born selfish and I was born rebellious. And if the parents said, don't do this or don't do that, then I knew that was where the fun had to be and that's where I was going. And I was totally self-centered. It was so bad. I remember I asked my parents one time, I said, because my friends had electric trains, you know, that they'd set up in their living room and I want an electric train really bad, and so I asked my parents for an electric train. My father said, son, we can't afford it. And I said, well, you can sell the car. 
And I didn't think it mattered very much because it didn't run most of the time anyway. <laughs> and then my sister, they're always comparing me with my sister. See, Gail and I have a commonality there. They're comparing me with my sister. My sister would save up her money for months at a time. We got a nickel a week for washing the dishes. How's that for minimum wage? And then if I complained about it, Dad said, you live in this house, now you can do it for free. I was, okay, I take it back. <laughs> anyway, she'd save up her money for months so she could buy Christmas presents for the other kids. And I'd spend my money and have nothing to give. And my parents would heap criticism and they'd heap condemnation on me for that. And the more criticism and condemnation they piled on me, the more emotionally disturbed and wounded I became. And the more emotionally, I mean, the more, self, more wrapped up in self I became. And what I really needed, see if this doesn't relate to some of you, what I really needed was for somebody to see into my heart and find a way to stimulate me to love and good deeds through honor, not condemnation. I needed somebody to see the tender heart, you know, the tender heart that, how many of you watched Lassie when you were kids? Do you remember that series of episodes called Lassie's Odyssey. Lassie got lost, this big collie dog. Well, to make matters worse, I had a collie dog, okay? So Lassie got lost. And in the third episode, I think it was, you know, you get that, that the whistle, you know, like they did in the show. And Lassie comes running over the hill, and little Timmy is crying. And I'm sitting in front of the television, and I'm crying. Because I had a tender heart, and all I needed was somebody to see that and lead me, you know, call it out. That's what a culture of honor does. The way you stimulate somebody, by the way, is verse 25, encouragement. Find the honorable thing. Find the good thing. Pour the Spirit of God out on that. Encouragement is the key to creating a culture of giving honor. I see a lot of young people. I see a lot of young people. They're struggling, struggling with direction for their lives. Some of them discouraged. Some of them bordering on depression. Some of them struggling. Some of them got great purpose. I'm talking about some. Some of them assume in their own minds that school is impossible because they can't afford it. They don't have the money or they think they're not smart enough because that's what they've been told all their lives. And so they kind of flounder for a long time. And again, not all of them, but I see enough of them. Now, in a culture of dishonor and judgment, which usually carries a set of justifications that sound really righteous, you might call them losers, and you might be tempted to write them off. But in a culture of honor, you see into their lives, you see by the gift of the Spirit, and, and you call out their gifts, and you call out their abilities, and you affirm them, and you speak into it, you, you speak into the awesomeness that God planted there because it's there, because they're created in God's image, and God's image cannot be erased. It's there in every one of us. You affirm the intelligence God gave them. You tell them you're proud of the young men and women they're becoming, and, and, and you tell them that they can, and because you see into who they really are, it's all truth. Some of them might not know as much as I do about certain things because of education and experience, but their gifts in certain areas go way beyond my own. A culture of honor affirms that, builds strength into it. Just recently, Elijah House went through a bit of a crisis, and it was really time to install my brother Mark as, as the overall leader, but I mean, he's only a year and a half younger than I am, but in, never in his entire life did anybody believe in him. He attended Denver Seminary, and the professors took him aside and told him, you should never go into ministry. You have absolutely no gifts for leadership. That's what they told him. Nobody ever believed in him. He sent me in after the board meeting in which, in which I really spoke hard into the board and got him installed as the director of Elijah House, not just the spiritual director, but the director of Elijah House and the chairman of his board. He wrote me this tender email and said, thank you for believing in me. You're the only one who ever has. And he has stepped up and pulled Elijah Hub, uh, House together and has turned into a fine leader with a staff that's working together with him. I'm telling you, that's what a culture of honor does. When you see into people and you call it out. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. 
to consider is to spend time thinking about something, to ponder on it, to work it over in your mind and heart, looking for solutions and ways. It's where your thoughts focus. What you spend time considering and pondering is what's going to come out of your mouth. If you're feeding on flaws, that's what you're going to, that's what you're going to speak. So we're pondering how to stimulate one another. How can I call out the gifts in, in Jim over here? How can I call out the gifts in Veronica? How many times have I kicked your butt and told you to start painting? She can't count. <laughs> because I want to call out the gift that's in her. And I could, there's a long list of people I want to do that with. If I fill my mind and my heart with, and my spiritual eyes with the glory God has built into the people around me and I'm working on ways to build them up and affirm them, I'll contribute to an atmosphere of honor. And that atmosphere of honor is going to condition how others think and see things. It'll be a holy culture, and it will open the floodgates of heaven. You know, people say, I get tested all the time. People say stupid things. They hurt one another. They violate boundaries. They do. They think God told them to do unbiblical things that God never validated in his word, and then when it doesn't work out, they blame God for the hurt. How many, how many, this is where I get tested. How many inaccurate prophetic words do I have to hear from the same person before I write them off? Or how often do I have to deal with their sense of offense over some real or imagined failure before I form a less than edifying opinion? How many times do I get accused of thinking or saying things I didn't think or say before I start considering, dwelling on, meditating on something other than stimulating love and good deeds? And then worse, the negative starts coming out of my mouth. In a culture of honor, we're looking for the God thing. Wanting to call that out. How do I call out the best in my brother and sister? How do I see past the offense? How do I touch that heart for good? I see a gift of prayer or healing or prophecy or compassion. How do I affirm that and activate that? How do I give encouragement? How do I strengthen the hand of God? I'm not talking about cheap words. I'm just talking about telling somebody they're, I'm not talking about just telling somebody they're awesome because that's what we do. Or telling somebody they're awesome just because they'll feel better or because they learned it's a good thing to do or because that's what everybody else is doing. I want to speak the truth, and the truth is there. I want to look for what's real. What did God put there? It's always there. Who are my brothers and sisters really? What does the image of God look like in them? I remember I told this story before, but there was a time I was so beaten and broken by the stuff that was being hurled at me at a Mega church where I was the executive pastor for a while. I was losing confidence in myself. I was falling into despair. Depression was sucking the life out of me. And that fed with a feeding frenzy in others because when you start to feel that way, the sharks come because they feel justified. And then there's that young woman showed up at my door, looked right past my feelings and into who God had made me to be, and she said, don't you let these people beat you down. You're a thoroughbred run like one. Yeah. That was encouragement and honor. It reminded me of what God had put in me. It was an impartation of strength that quickened me to run again and be the winner God had called me to be. That kind of thing is what the apostle was driving at. Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Focus attention there. Turn it over in the heart. Consider it. Think about it. And let it become the culture we live in. Paul said it another way. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. I like to retranslate that because there's a Greek word that can be translated if or since. So listen to how this changes. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, since there is some excellence... And since there is things worthy of praise, dwell on these things. That's where we focus. So here's what I want to do at the end today. And Nathan's going to be bringing some youth in to do something too, so we're going to go a little longer. But I want to have an honor fest. And here's how it works. If there's someone in here, I'm going to turn on a microphone. If there is someone here that you, want to, that you know needs to be encouraged that needs to receive some honor, whether they're obviously deserving it or just needing it. I'm holding an open mic, and maybe just three, three or four people. I want you to come up here, 
and I want you to call out the person that you know needs encouragement and bring them up here and in front of everybody. In front of, this is not a typical ministry time. In front of everybody, deliver that encouragement. And the rest, everybody else, you can feed on that. And then when we leave here today, I want you to go do the same thing to the people that you hang with. So who's going to be courageous and do this? Somebody you know needs encouragement, and you're going to come up here, and you're going to call them out, and you're going to bring them up here and encourage them in front of everybody. Don't be chicken. Here she comes. All right. She can do this. <laughs> I want to encourage this amazing young man in my life. He is absolutely amazing, but very broke. Is he here? But I don't want to embarrass him, so I want to respect him. Okay. <laughs> so, um, many prayers for him would be great. Thank you all. <laughs> okay. Okay, here she goes. I can't stand microphones, though. Yeah, but I hope you got. Elaine's still here. But you got to use one. There they are. But, yep, so put John it up there. and Elaine, come on up here. Come on, guys. Come on. <laughs> They have been an integral part of this fellowship for decades. They've encouraged so many people. John believes in men like you would not believe. He's been praying for my husband for years and many men. And Elaine loves on the women over and over, no matter what they look like. When I used to teach in the two-year-olds, with the two-year-olds, um, one time I didn't come in smelling very fresh and they didn't judge me and they fed into me for decades and years until I became sober and I've been sober for years <laughs> these people do that over and over with so many people and they grow weary and they grow tired and I hope everybody encourages them all right <laughs> God bless you guys anybody else okay Okay, Patty, I'm calling you out, my little sugar lump. <laughs> Come on. Yes, I would. <laughs> okay, this lady has worked her guts out for decades. And, and she's in constant pain from her back and everything. And she comes faithfully to feed people, to help people. I'm so glad I know her. <laughs> All right. What's that? Can we do it now? Let, let, let me take one more of these. One more. And then they're going to, then we're going to hand it over to them. Anybody else? Yeah. Boy. Oh. I'm not going to stand up. Okay. Well, Charity stood up too, so we're going to do both yeah, of them. I'll do it after you. Okay. <laughs> Mark and Cam. <laughs> I don't know if very many of you know them very well, but they are the most generous couple I think I have ever met. They're giving, they're thoughtful and generous. I mean, you just give and give and give this... Thank you. <laughs> All right. And heaven notices. <laughs> All right, come on, Greg. This will be the last one, then I'm going to turn it over to the crazy people. <laughs> well, first off, my wife is amazing. <laughs> um, she married me when I was still very immature and broken and, you know, coming out of a very rough life because I loved the Lord. And she gave her life to me because she knew that I would always love God. And at the end of the day, that my heart would be his. And, you know, through me working through trauma, stress from my childhood and, I mean, violent depression, other life circumstances that were horrendous, she never judged me. She never turned away from me. She never took it out on me. Not once. We've been married for almost eight years. And, and it was finally when I stopped beating myself with her love and I just started receiving it, when I stopped seeing myself as unworthy of it and started seeing that I am worthy of it was when I really started to change. But we actually came up here to talk about Brett and Sarah. <laughs> yeah, come on up, guys. 
<laughs> there you go. Sarah has been one of my wife's closest <laughs> friends for a while. And, um, I, you know, it wasn't like we do anything spectacular together. You know, it's not anything extravagant. We just spend time, but you guys really are two of our closest friends. And people that, when we don't have that time with you, when we don't have that connection with you, you know, that there is, there is a deficit. There is something that we're lacking just from not being around you guys. And, you know, the way that you love my wife and you invest in her, her desire to do artistic things means so much to me. And that even you guys would be willing to, you know, take time out of your life. And you guys took us out to dinner one time and those are small things, but we really love you, and we just wanted to honor you. Right. I would encourage you to linger. I know we're going over today, but what's about to happen is important. Um, so we're just having an altar call for anybody who just wants freedom, just to come up here and get prayed for. Because um, I really believe that the Lord wants to just deliver a lot of people today from anything that they're going through, any chains that are holding them back from just seeking the whole face of the Lord. Um, and he just wants to set you free because he loves you so freaking much. So just come up here right now if you want freedom, um, whoever. It, we're not just going to be the only one pray, praying. If the ministry team wants to come up, that's awesome. Um, Pastor Lauren will pray with us. If any of the youth want to pray over people, that's awesome. But please like just come get free your heart he loves you so much and he's he died to like set you free of everything this isn't like i'm free because i'm a christian this is i'm truly free because christ died for me and he like gave his life for me and like that's all i want for people to understand is that he loves you so much you know you got to know the value of who you are you got to know the price that he paid so i don't know <laughs> if you want to come up and get prayed Amen. prayer Mother, I see your hand up